Alright, welcome back. Today we're going over a recent pro game between Lee Ji-hoon and Kang Dong-yoon, uh, both Korean professionals. I just really like this game, and I also, a lot of times, it's interesting to see these sort of asymmetric matchups. Uh, Lee Ji-hoon is just a Fordon professional, and Kang Dong-yoon is one of the top players in Korea at the moment, uh, easily in the top you know, 20 players. So we probably have a little bit of a skill differential, but what I really liked about this game is that it's reasonably easy to understand for a pro game. Like, even when they get into fights, it's, we can tell what they're going for. And there's just a lot of cool sequences, because basically both players kind of get what they want in this game, and then by the end of it, black is just ahead, <laughs> magically. So it's kind of neat just to look at the positional judgment of uh, Black in this game and how he uses it to eventually come out with an edge. So I'm going to start off pretty straightforward, uh, getting into the mini Chinese opening here with this Black establishing this framework on the bottom side of the board. Uh, white splits, and one thing that we've started seeing is fewer splits and more often approaches or something a little bit more dynamic the if all white does is make a two space extension here and now black uh, could probably continue to attack the white stones or could play this approach move but let's just compare you know the last two moves for black here and here and compare how much white is getting with the two space extension so, for playing two moves, it seems to me, and I think that this is kind of becoming a consensus, is that just a two-space extension is just a little slow. Now, granted, on a strategic level, we've, we've broken the relationship between the framework projecting up the side to the star point. But white's not going to really get territory with these two moves. And if black encloses the corner, I mean, this could end up being a big corner. An approach move is obviously a really big move. So what we're seeing recently is pros trying to be a little bit more active, even when they're playing the splitting move. And white has a cool idea here. White makes a three-space jump. And I did some pattern review of some pro games in the databases. And in every other game that I looked at, uh, of which there's not many. This is not super, super common to make this three-space jump. But in every other game I looked at, Black enclosed this corner in response, and then White defended in some way. And I, uh, in the four games that I found, White did this uh, twice, this once, and this once. So, you know, all, you know, and, and they all do the same thing. They defend this side group. So, you know, we have options. You know, if we... The, the important thing is to have a plan. And so if we say, okay, I'm going to make this three-space jump. If black encloses the corner, I want to defend this group. Well, pros have not settled on, you know, they've, they've chosen three different moves to defend this group. So as long as you have the idea, okay, now I need to defend uh, one space jump, sure. Uh, make a diagonal move, sure. Totally makes sense. Play this knight's jump, you know, sure. Okay, they're all defending the group. So that's the main thing. But in this game, black does something different. Black invades immediately. White attaches down here. And typically, uh, we might see something with white coming on top. This is, this is a variation. The problem here is that these stones are going to be floating. And while they're not weak, they're not, they have you know, no way to make a base. They're going to have to flail around in the center. And if these have to flail around in the center, we could see black maybe enclosing a lot of the lower side. And that we don't want that. So white, at this point, instead of trying to connect to the stone at R10, instead, oh, let's go back to the game. Instead, Atari's on this side. Black cuts off the stone. And this is a poor result, just looking at the initial extension. If you make an extension and black comes in and immediately cuts it off, you may have played at the wrong point. But in this case, white has a plan, and that's to build strength here with these stones, with you know two stone wall facing the corner and two stones facing the center. This is a pretty thick shape. And there's an eye in Gote here, if, if you need one. And then white attacks the corner. 
So this is a this is a neat idea to be a little bit more active than just splitting the side because we can see here now that this framework that was facing the star point is also destroyed just as if we had made a two space extension but white's playing more actively so it gives you an idea of what pros go for that they're just you know maybe that two space extension isn't quite enough so black plays one move to sort of do a makeshift defense in the corner and keep you know some connection with this framework on the bottom with this stone and then uh, instead of continuing to play down here, black goes and approaches the corner. Interestingly, we get a few moves up here, <clears throat> and then white continues to, you know, play in the lower right. The idea being that you want to follow up with your intentions. So essentially, black ignored over here, played one move, white responded, and then black went to play this. White got Sente coming out of this corner Joseki, and then continues following up, attacking the weak stones. Black slides into the corner. White makes a base on this side because this pressures the top group. And a lot of times we'll see this two space extension and this uh, corner is being sort of mei for white. So in this case, white says, you know, I want to pressure this group more than I want to keep you out of the corner. Black takes the corner, and then white comes back again and says, all right, now I'm really just destroying, you know, your, uh, your corner position in the lower right. So it's an exchange. Black encloses the top corner. And this is interesting because normally in this shape, uh, with these, these two stones in particular, normally there's an invasion point uh, at A. But, in this case, it's not working so well because the stones at B are very strong. And this stone is essentially a two-space extension from a two-stone wall, which is very thick. And it doesn't seem like this invasion at A is working well for white at this point. It, so, uh, because of the stones at B and the stone at R12, this invasion would probably be an overplay once black has enclosed the corner like this. Uh, this is kind of, you know, natural extension point um, in the center. And one thing to notice about the spacing of the A stone is that it leaves room for a two-space extension at B. And this is always kind of, this is a good strategy when you're trying to decide where to extend is to leave yourself room for another two-space extension. Because if something complicated happens, and at some point black ends up, you know, who knows, maybe black ends up with uh, a stone over here cutting this stone off, you can still make a base. So it, it leaves you a lot more flexibility with this extension. The other thing to note, too, is that when we do come this close to the two stone wall, for black to make a counter extension to here is a little narrow. This would be a big move in the middle game, but right now, we can see that it's not very efficient because we're only expending two spaces from a two-stone wall. And now, if, you know, white responds with this, now, like, I mean, this is looking like a pretty well-balanced situation here. It's a little far, but we're reinforcing, we're reducing, yeah. So just something to look at in the spacing on that move. Black comes back to the lower right and builds some thickness in the center while giving white a good, strong... Uh, territory and now we see black coming back because like I said this is big don't get me wrong but it's just a little little inefficient and that's one of the things that if you can force your opponent to make a series of slightly inefficient moves you can come out with a pretty significant advantage uh, white goes to reduce and this is a really neat sequence in terms of using Aji because white has the stone at R10 which is badly damaged obviously it's been cut off from the white corner. It's right up against a thick black shape. There's a pincer stone essentially already there. And so white says, well, you know, let's see, let's see what use I can make of that stone. And what white wants black to do is just come through and separate so that white can sap sacrifice this R10 stone cleanly and get some forcing moves on the outside and sente. Uh, black will not do that. Instead, <laughs> Black plays up here, 
And the idea behind this move is that Black's saying, no, you should connect your stones, because now you have three stones with no eye shape, and they're heavy, and I can attack all of them. So it's kind of interesting here how both players are trying to get their opponent to, <laughs> to do something with this stone at R10, and both players are saying, no, 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 no. You do something about that stone. Uh, since it's not advantageous for white to save it, and it's not advantageous for black to just kill one stone and gote. So, white attaches on the other side, black hanes, white cuts. And this is the type of situation where we go back, as always, to ladders. And most of shape comes down to ladders. And I'll, I'll get into that more uh, in a little bit here, but in this case, the basic shape here is a cross cut and extend. I know that the order was a little different, but we have these three white stones. It's essentially as if there was just a cross cut and then white extended. There's a Go proverb that says, when caught in a cross cut, extend. And the reason for that is that it threatens a ladder. So if black ignores this white extension and plays somewhere else, white can start a ladder. Now, of course, before we try to capture a stone on the ladder, we have to read. And if we do read, we realize in this case that this goes straight to this black stone. So this ladder is not working for white right now. But if you can make the connection between why do we extend in a crosscut? Because it threatens a ladder on one of the two stones. Maybe that allows you to understand this advice a little bit more, is that we're extending because it threatens a ladder. So. Like we were saying, we read the ladder out. The ladder is not working right now. So black actually plays back here because the, you know, the ladder isn't working, so we don't have to worry about this stone directly. And now this kind of solidifies this capture and gives this black group, you know, make sure that it can escape if need be, that it has a little bit of room to make a base. And another interesting thing to look at is back from the beginning of the game with these two stones on S8 and S7, Capturing the stone is big for both players, but it's also gote, and that makes it an endgame move. If this move were sente, to get an eye and sente, one of these players might have played it already. But as it stands, this capture is having no impact on the flow of the game, and so it's something that should be left for endgame. And, you know, if, if this situation were sort of flipped where the stone to be captured was on the outside, then it would be a very urgent move. But if white goes and plays this move on the first line, we can see that T7 right here, this is not affecting the game anymore. You know, this we just took one stone off the board, and it's not even that big territorial, you know, in terms of territory. So this is the type of move that, I mean, you would, especially, you know, weaker Q players would see a stone in Atari and just be like, oh, I should, I should capture it. But, you know, if you're not getting that much for the stone, you know, consider other options. Uh, you want to use your sente wisely. All right, so white has an interesting plan now. White attaches here, and now we have to read again, is the ladder working? And if we go, we read white plays here, that forces black to extend. White plays here, forces black to extend. White plays here, black extends, and then there's a white stone here, so we can just capture. So now the ladder is working for white. It's pretty interesting. So we can see here that the plan for white is not necessarily to do anything with any of these specific four stones over here, but rather to get some forcing moves on the outside somewhere. It's a really light style of playing to, you know, just you get in, you have a few stones here, a few stones there, and eventually you can get a little bit of an advantage. Black responds with the Hane, and again, we have to read, is the ladder working? And in this case, no, this move breaks the ladder. It's kind of interesting. White actually plays the first uh, Atari in the sequence right here. And the reason is that now when white plays this counter Hane on the top, the ladder is working again. And this is, like I, said, like I say, ladders are a great place to start practicing your reading because they're unbranched. And they can be pretty long, but they're unbranched. And if you start realizing, whoa, I can read 10 moves in a ladder really easy, that gives you a lot more confidence when you're in a more complicated life and death situation. And you're like, wait, no, no, no. I can actually read 10 moves ahead. Especially if you start to f 
figure out which sequences are forcing, because if your opponent has to respond in a certain way, even a 20 move sequence is easy to read. If it's a ladder going straight across the board, it's super easy to visualize that. It just takes a little bit of practice. And what we're seeing here is a good example of why it's useful to be able to read ladders quickly, because in each of the last several moves, the status of whether the ladder is working or not has changed, and that's it is just important to be able to follow that. So now black uh, doesn't really want to just hane right here, uh, which would you know re-break the ladder, but black instead just escapes with the two stones. But that allows white to get in these forcing moves up here. So basically, these four stones have been more or less sacrificed. Uh, we'll see white pull some out in a minute, but these four stones are not the important stones. The important thing is that white's getting these reducing uh, forcing moves up in this situation. White captures, <clears throat> goes back to say, well, you know, maybe I can still capture these three stones. Black says, no, I'm going to come back and take this one. And now, the thing is, this ko is not really worth fighting for black, which is why black comes back and connects, because if black decides to keep fighting this ko, and, you know, let's just say, whatever, um, and then black makes a ineffective ko threat, this second capture just makes white unbelievably thick. And black doesn't want white to get super thick in this position, because we started out with white just playing a few forcing moves, trying to get a small advantage, and now white's just dominating the upper side here with this double capture shape, which is just super, super thick. Uh, it's really hard to understate how strong this white formation is. So black doesn't want that even being a possibility. So black just says, you know what, I'm just going to come back here and connect. Now white expands. You know, now that white's gotten these forcing moves in, it looks like the top is kind of looking like a decent framework for white. And black uh, has to defend here. And this is always, you know, this, this contest between sente and gote uh, is really interesting because right now black has to ask, is this sente? And the answer is yes, because black is undercut on the upper left and has the close... Um, uh, pincer stone on the mid left. So if black ignores this to, you know, do something else like, oh, I'm going to reduce this framework, now, oh, you know, white coming in looks really nasty. And you've got to realize that, you know, white can always jump in over here. There's just too much going on. So black will come under severe attack. So black has to back off a little bit. And then white comes back and plays this. Now again, we have to ask ourselves, is this move sente? And this time the answer is no, because this isn't threatening these three stones in any severe way. It's just creating a definite base for the white group over here. And that base is important because if white doesn't play that move and decides, okay, now I'm going to just enlarge the framework or do something like that. Now if black plays something like this, uh, white is the one who's under severe attack in this variation because black spent the move to protect the group in the upper left. White kind of owes a move to protect the group in the lower left. <clears throat> And this is just kind of a neat, okay, so we're going to reduce, and this aims at the connection on top of the white stone, but it also aims at the cut through the two-point jump. And it's just right on the boundary line. So this is going to be hard to keep this stone inside the, the framework. So this is, a, this is a good reducing move. It aims at a lot of different options. And you want to have lots of options when you're reducing and invading. So white, nonetheless, does try to keep black in, but we're going to see this is not quite happening. Black builds up some thickness and cuts through right here. But <clears throat> at the same time, white is building some strength facing the active part of the board. So, you know, that's, it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, 
white's framework gets destroyed but it gets a little thicker on the outside and with these extra stones it seems much more possible to rescue these three even if black tries to cut here so there's definitely definitely some trade-off now black tries to create a small framework on the bottom just because there's not really a lot of big areas left so this is how the moves dwindle in size as the game goes on like this would trying to make this four line <laughs> framework in the beginning of the game would be very slow, but now that it's the biggest area on the board, it's kind of natural to go for it. White does the same thing, comes in to reduce, doesn't want to come in deep and get trapped in here, but does want to limit the potential. Black comes out, and this is a great all-purpose move because one, it's threatening to maybe rescue this stone, it's reducing white's center prospects, it's threatening to come back and now uh, keep this stone from escaping and so white has to jump out and here we see a little bit of uh, this is again this black is aiming to use this forcing move to keep these white stones from connecting to anything white says well I'm gonna ignore that and turn into the corner here and this just gives white a little bit more solid shape for making eyes because this cut's going to be gote for sure now and then comes back and connects against the shoulder hit and this is where man if i were white i would be really worried <laughs> right now just with these two stones now that black got uh these three stones in it's like oh where are these two stones gonna go <laughs> but uh white starts by forcing and white again has just a really light way about this so black makes this double peep and you know a lot of us our first instinct would be oh okay well I've got to I've got to connect would it be better to connect to A or connect to B but white says you know black's got a lot of stones around here is really strong I'm not worried about any individual stone I just want to make sure that black doesn't get this whole area so white extends here saying you can you can peep and cut and do whatever you want I'm not really worried about it because if black just says oh okay well let's swallow well if I do this that's only one stone that's no good but if I do this that's gonna be like three or four stones that's pretty good comes down but you know white's not gonna care about these white's just gonna sacrifice uh, and actually, this isn't even working in this variation because this is just a ladder. So black can't cut over there on this on this other side. So it's just white's using the stones to really good effect, keeping everything, uh, you know, as connected as possible while staying light. And black is going to come back and prevent the Hane over here now that these two stones are there. So white comes out, black chases. And now black actually comes back and defends the territory rather than trying to cut any of the stones off. It's kind of an interesting, interesting maneuver. And now you can see, you know, this stone's protecting this cut. This is a pretty successful, assuming white doesn't get captured entirely, but now that white's out, it seems like that would be difficult to do. Uh, this seems like a pretty successful reduction. Uh, black is getting forced all the way down to the third line, which is good, good for white. And the white gets to turn out. So this is looking super solid. Uh, this is another move that I really like. Um, not a lot of people necessarily see this. When you have a stone here, and uh, you can do this, threatening to both push out uh, through the one-point jump at C8, or to play back uh, over at B9 and connect back to your stone. So white plays here. And this is kind of a tricky sequence, but I think the end result is really neat. Basically, black's going to sacrifice these two stones to get everything linked up, make white's shape really ugly, and do this all. <clears throat> See, so now black even gets to seal off this side because white has to come back and capture these. And this dumpling shape is, you want to avoid that if you can. In this case, it was forced. But so anyway, because of this two stone sacrifice, black sealed all this off forced white into bad shape, connected all the stones. Uh, and that's kind of big because, you know, it doesn't necessarily make points just to have this group up here connected to the bottom. 
but it makes your position really thick. Like, white can't kill anything anymore, so any potential tricky invasions and whatnot become much, much harder, because there's no way to kill a group that... Well, you have two living groups, both of which have room for two eyes that are connected to each other. There's no way to take away four eyes <laughs> from two different groups to start an attack. And here we see a little bit... Uh, this, again, you know, if, if these groups weren't so strong, this move threatening to separate them might be sente. But in this case, black can go back and reduce the upper side, which allows white to destroy this potential center area that black was building at the same time. And here we see the same kind of Tsuji again with this making Miai of coming through the one-point jump and connecting back out. And again, uh, white decides to ignore this peep to come back and solve this situation, essentially, and uh, manages to do it in a very clever way by forcing black to connect here and then doing the monkey jump. Basically, you know, when black connects here, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, I'm committed to this side territory. And again, most of us would probably respond to the monkey jump, you know, keep our, keep our small territory over here, but the problem is, is that even if we see this, you know, this is not very many points. This is like eight points, nine points, ten, maybe ten, I don't know. Um, it's not a very big area. So black does something kind of non-intuitive and actually ignores the monkey jump to play over here. Black sees an opening and pushes into this minimal area that white has built. But we realize now that once black has gotten this stone, black can capture here. I don't even see that this group has definitively got two eyes. It's close. I mean, it could play a gote move here to get two eyes. But it's not 100% yet. Black plays some forcing moves before really getting into it, and then starts this ko. This is kind of an interesting co situation because black just wants to get something out of this. Uh, it doesn't, and it's it's threatening to you know capture this white white stone, which would rescue the black stone, which would kill the corner. So this is kind of a flower viewing co for. And you know I I I wonder if I should use that phrase. It took me like years of reading go books and seeing that phrase before I understood what it meant. And it wasn't until I got stronger. And I realized that a flower viewing co is just a one-sided co. And the logic, I guess, is that it's as pleasant as going to a flower viewing for, <laughs> for one side. So in this case, it's like black is just looking at the flowers, you know, going to smell the roses, so to speak, whereas white is struggling for his life and death. So uh, I think in English, the phrase one-sided co is, is much more understandable. But... There's just something poetic about some of these Japanese translations of the way they describe things. So, flower viewing co it is. <clears throat> and basically, Black's just going to say, yeah, but I've got so many co-threats against, you know, all your stones in here. What are you going to do? Uh, White's like, well, I've got co-threats on the bottom, too. And here, White says, no, okay, we're just no we're not going to do this. And so there's a little bit of an exchange because once black gets this stone, black doesn't need the co anymore. This is an Atari. We're linking our stones up. We're destroying white territory. And we're doing it in Sente. Because white's going to have to come back and remove this lingering uh, co situation. So we got some reduction in Sente. Always good. And now black comes back to capture this stone. And like I said, you know, this, these two stones have been hanging around in Atari since the beginning of the game. But now we're at a point where it makes sense to spend a move territorially, there's not anything more valuable on the board. Even coming back to answer this monkey jump, there's not really a big follow-up for the monkey jump. Just like, what, white can Kasumi here and make a diagonal move? It's about it. So black comes back and finally takes that stone off the board. And... That's most of the really interesting... Another thing I want to point out is how eventually black comes and swallows up these moves that white originally had as forcing. That's not necessarily a big deal. You forced for that position 
at a certain point in the game, and then later in the game, those stones ended up not being as important, and so white just sacrificed them. They already did their job. They got us to a position where we could do certain things at a certain point in the game, and, you know, now we don't need them. So if it's bigger to play somewhere else than to rescue them, then that's what we should do. Another thing to note about ignoring this uh, monkey jump is that this wouldn't really have been as possible if black hadn't connected earlier in the game. And this is why connection is so important, is that it makes you thick. You know, this move kind of threatens to steal the base from this upper group, but black had bigger moves on the board, and since these stones on the upper left were connected all the way down, there wasn't a need to respond to these moves, which made the monkey jump and its follow-up um, gote. So white had to play these two moves, and normally we think of the monkey jump as being sente, because usually it is, because usually our opponent answers it, and there's no way for our opponent to answer it and get sente. But if it's not big enough, your opponent will ignore it. And it's this positional judgment of saying, yeah, that's big, but this over here is just a little bit bigger, uh, that, you know, professionals really focus on that. And that's part of why being able to count accurately is a big part of getting stronger, because, you know, if you can't figure out the relative value of moves, it makes it hard to play an accurate endgame. And here we just have, this is kind of the tail end, black manages to come in and destroy some of this territory on the bottom. Both players are kind of getting the last bit they can, but the problem is that black is pretty much, well black is ahead at this point, and white is just kind of trying to see if there's any possibility to get something going, but the odds are that it's not. So, just some end game, end game pushes, and then this is where I think white is just kind of looking for a place to resign, and there's nothing down here, so I don't know exactly why white played these, you know, uh, cut in Atari, but uh, black connects here and white resigns because black just has a little bit more overall. And so you can see, you know, like white destroyed this territory over here. Uh, you know, black, white at one point was getting something in the center and that never materialized. White was able to destroy a lot of this potential on the bottom. But, you know, this, this upper right corner is really big. And this corner ended up not being worth very much, for especially given the number of moves that white played. Let's go back and look at the opening real quick. And I'll show you just how many moves white played down here. White's going to jump in there, and then white even descends here. So we can kind of see, you know, um, how to count this say one, two, three, four, five, six stones to the two black stones. So this is kind of like if white played four moves in a corner more than black, I think we would expect more out of this corner for white at the end of the game than what white actually got, which is not really that many points. One, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up just, just shy of 20, probably, uh, which is a good size, but it's not game-breaking. And compared to the black in the upper right, black definitely got a much larger corner uh, and, and has territory in other places besides, and white just doesn't really have a big territory. Like, this is okay, this is okay, but that's about it. It's just this corner, two okay territories and four points over here, not enough not enough to make, uh, to, to win the game, even with Comey. So, earlier I mentioned something about 90% of shape uh, being uh, based on ladders, and just to show you, like, what I mean, you know, if we have a shape like this, um, 
You know, this is pretty common. We end up, we have a cutting point, and it ends up being protected by this knight's jump. Uh, the thing with this is that it comes back into a ladder. So it's white cuts, ladder. You know, this, these stones are potentially captured, depending on the status of the ladder. And again, uh, when we have situations, what's another good one? It's not the screw. Uh, what's another good example of this? Um, oh, like I was saying, in a in a crosscut, extend because we're threatening a ladder on one of the stones. Extend this way, and w depending on which way we extend, we're threatening different ladders. So uh, actually, let's let me reverse the colors here and say now for white extending, we have two ways to do this. If we say want to capture the central stone in a ladder or threaten to. We could extend here, or we could extend here. Now, the thing is, is that these ladders are going to be a little different. So, for example, if there happens to be a black stone, say, here, I believe this ladder is no longer working. Yeah, so um, now this ladder is broken for white. But in this case, if we extend up like this, this other ladder is not. So if black says, OK, I want to live in the corner, white can now play here, and this ladder is working. It just manages to slide by uh, the black stone here. So you know we have different options. So that's kind of why you know, a, lot of, a lot of shape comes down to making or breaking ladders efficiently. And uh, you know just something to think about. Ladders become really crucial in terms of tactical infighting because it just, making a panuki is so large that you have to avoid it, generally speaking. So in this situation, like this, black will not, let me go back at it, black will not extend down here. Black will extend from this stone to, to keep the ladder from working, essentially. And that's almost forced. So then as white, you know, we know if we're going to extend here, black almost has to play here, and doesn't 100% have to, uh, you know, because this Atari would be breaking the ladder as well, although it's probably not a good move because we're really hurting the cornerstone. Black could also extend up if keeping the liberties on this group were short. But a lot of, lot of tactics come down to just simple things like counting liberties and ladders and nets. And, you know, ladders in particular are a great place to practice your reading because they're unbranched. And if you can get fast at reading ladders, A, your reading in general will speed up, but also every time you're in a crosscut, you've got to evaluate like four or five different ladders to figure out what move is going to be best or what move is going to be working. And you <laughs> and there's there's lots of other situations too. Like another another good one is this um, invasion like this when um, let's put a white stone over here. When black comes up like this, uh, one of the key questions is, is this wedge working for white? And in order for this wedge to work, white needs a ladder breaker on both sides, basically, because there's this ladder starting from here that we need to work. And then there's also, let's see, <clears throat> um, What's the other option? Down, up. Oh, the other is we need to make sure that I wasn't thinking of doing this lesson right at the end of this game review, so I'm not terribly prepared. Uh, the other one is we need to make sure that this ladder is working for white. So as long as both of those ladders are working for white, white gets a much better result in this position by wedging instead of just extending or playing an attachment. So ladders come up in all kinds of positions. Like I said, every time there's a cross cut, you're going to have to think about at least three, four, maybe more different ladders going different ways. So definitely something to focus on. 
But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the game. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting, relatively peaceful, easy to understand uh, pro game. And I just thought, particularly the sequence in the upper right where they're maneuvering around a ladder for several moves was particularly cool. So anyway, like I said, I hope you enjoyed that and thank you for watching.